3 all the way through verse 40. And Lord willing, next Sunday we will take up the 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians, the resurrection chapter, one of the most profound things ever written, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we are finishing up this section that really began in chapter 12, and you could, you could even argue chapter 11, a portion of what we read just a few minutes ago, all addressing disorder, chaos, confusion in the church at Corinth. Um, chapter 12, taking up the, the idea that you're to be one body, many members, but one body functioning together, uh, discussing the, the abuse of the charismata, the spiritual gifts, delving into those more specifically, pairs and contrasts, prophecy and tongues, arguing that I believe that what they were doing in Corinth concerning tongues was not necessarily the gift of tongues, and then asserting the superiority of prophecy, of speaking intelligible words, in a language that people commonly understood. He's been carrying that theme, and of course he interrupted it, a little parenthesis on 1 Corinthians 13 on love, how, how if you will practice love, unconditional agape love, a lot of these things will be addressed. Coming to the end of this section, chapter 14, verses 33b, the last part of that, all the way through to chapter 14, verse 40. Stand with me if you would, if you found that in your Bibles, and if you don't happen to have uh, your Bible, a Bible with you, uh, we've got it on the screen for you. I want you to see, hear, we read aloud every Lord's Day because we want you to say the Word of God. You follow along as I read these portions. Picking up in the middle of what we recognizes verse 33 as in all the churches of the saints the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but should be in submission as the law also says if there's anything they desire to learn let them ask their husbands at home for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church or was it from you that the word of god came or are you the only ones it is reached if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And And we need this word today, receive it for what it says, and be careful to recognize what it does not say. We're going to unpack this, hopefully, in a very balanced uh, analogy of faith approach as the Reformers practice Scripture, interpreting Scripture. Thank you. Please be seated. Prophecy, that is the... the, uh, Primarily the speaking forth of gospel truth, God's truth, is critical and necessary. Uh, It should take up a significant portion of the corporate gathering of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go read, you can find online an English translation translation of a a document called the Didache, which was the the teaching, and and it spells out in one portion of it what the worship services looked like in the early church, and, and they sang together, they prayed together, uh, they had a preaching, what we recognize as preaching, the telling forth of God's truth to, to exhort and instruct. Paul said in Timothy, the second, second Timothy, that all Scripture is God-breathed, it is all profitable, it helps us to understand the teaching. Uh, it also will rebuke us when we need to be rebuked. It will 
encourage us when we need to be encouraged. It will instruct us when we need to be instructed. It will admonish us. It, it, the scripture, all Scripture, read by God, is profitable for us. And so that should take up our time. It should take up your daily devotions. Reading the Scripture. We just came through two sessions these past Sunday nights, two Sunday nights, on the importance of Bible intake. Let me say it right now. If you're not regularly involved in Bible intake, you are starving to death spiritually. And a lot of the foolishness that goes on in churches today is because people are starving to death spiritually. They're not instructed by the Word. They're not informed by the Word. They're not fed by the Word. So Paul puts a high premium on prophecy. And what he's talking about is prophecy we call now, the 21st century, the Word of God. Contained in the books, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament. That's what he's pushing for here. He puts the superiority of prophecy to tongues. Tongues, a gift that would, uh, when manifested properly, would be a speaking in a foreign language, uh, not necessarily heretofore known by the speaker. That's what happened at Pentecost, remember. It was this phenomenal UN hookup <laughs> before there was a UN hookup, where they come out of the upper room preaching the gospel. And we don't know. We don't know whether God gave to these folks, the 120 in the upper room, the capacity to speak in a foreign language they had not heretofore known. But what we do know is that the people gathered there who were gathered from all these different nations as spelled out in Acts said, wait, aren't these folks Galileans? In other words, they ought to be speaking a certain dialect, and yet I hear them speaking in my language. The gift of tongues. Not multisyllabic, unintelligible gibberish. The only place that shows up Bible times and Old Testament times coming out of Scripture times is in the ecstatic cults, which, by the way, were present in Corinth. Paul's made it very plain. Prophesy. Speak intelligible, meaningful words. Now, this passage is controversial, obviously. Because he just flat out says something about the role of women in corporate worship that would uh, certain groups of women were to hear me preaching this, I would probably be mauled and beaten to a pulp. Not by anybody here, but in terms of walking outside, they would, you know, you may not realize this. In Austin last week, Celebration Church in Austin, Texas, had a protest outside with LBGTQ plus XYZ, whatever the number, late letters are now, and wanting to shut the church down. So you ask, well, what crime has this church committed that needs to be shut down? They take a firm pro-life stand against abortion. They believe marriage is to be between one man and one woman, heterosexual, monogamous marriage. They reject uh, transgenderism. So you, the crowd that was outside said, these people, these people are hateful, they're bigots, they don't love, they want to shut them down. And kind of stuff happens. It's happening more and more all around us. You've got to be aware of this, folks. Paul is not unclear in these matters. But we need to be clear what he's saying and what he's not saying. So let's look at this. We're going to unpack this along three headings today. First of all, the role of women in corporate worship, verses 34 to 36. This is the, the controversial verses. Uh, secondly, the test of the genuineness of prophetic spirituality, verses 37 and 38. And then finally, verses 39 and 40, the sum of the matter. He's, he's now going to tie up what he's been talking about the last several chapters. Look at this first idea, the role of women in corporate worship. Verses 34 to 36, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. 
for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? He's getting sarcastic here with them. Or are you the only ones that is reached? Now, what Paul is not doing here, clear this up, is he is not putting a gag order on the sound of female voices in corporate worship. And you know this because you just read responsively in chapter 11 where the Apostle Paul said in verse 4, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. He's not, we went through this in chapter 11. We studied this some time ago now. We've pointed out to you then, he's not talking about a woman praying at home, a woman sharing with her neighbor. He's talking about corporate worship. And he contemplates, he anticipates that in corporate worship, women will pray aloud. Women will prophesy aloud. And he gives an order to it how it needs to be done in an orderly way. So, he's, so do not let someone take chapter 14, and uh, I've seen some chauvinistic types do this, uh, and basically say, you women need to sit down and shut up. And what are you saying? But he is saying something. It's important to understand what he is saying. He is saying that this is not a local thing. It's not, it's not a... A, a culturally contextual issue in Corinth, though what he's talking about definitely applies to Corinth, but it's in all the churches. This is a principle. The principle comes out of creation, Genesis, not only in how God formed man and woman, and you read that in 1 Corinthians 11, that, he, that, that woman did, man did not come from woman, woman came from man. She was taken out of man, that's what woe man means, is out of man, and formed, became a living being. Paul tells Timothy, we're going to read this in a few minutes, about how conduct needs to be in the church, and he cites creation and the fall. These are not cultural matters. Creation stands eternally and universally. The fall of man and woman stands eternally and universally. So, you've got to understand the principles operating here. And what he's dealing with, in fact, let's look at it now. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. Now, we've, we've exegeted this before when we went through the pastoral epistles. He's not saying, don't read this wrong, I do not permit a woman to teach. He's not saying that. If he was saying that, then we are violating Scripture. And when you pick this up in Titus, when he talks about women uh, teaching other women, we've looked at them being keepers of teaching children. But we unpack these things from the Scripture, and therefore in our Bible study times, we have a women's class where a woman teaches women. We have, we have some children's classes where, where a woman will teach the children. What he's prohibiting here is a woman standing in authority, in an authoritative teaching role, teaching men. It's not because women are inferior. It's because God expects men to step up and act like men. Too often, and you know this is true, it's, it's, look, brothers and sisters, our first father, Adam, was the first wimp, right? He wimped out. You know he did. Eve, all the tree, pleasant to the eyes. The enemy of our souls convinced her it was good for food. Took and ate. And see, we, we tend to stop thinking, how could she do that? Keep on reading. And she gave to her husband who was with her. 
Larry Crabb's written an excellent book entitled The Silence of Adam. Man limped out in the garden. Ever since then, given the right opportunity and the right circumstances, it will wimp out again. And this is the thing, it's, it's, it's interesting that this will happen in the spiritual, religious nurturing realm, perhaps more than any other. I've known men through the years who would stomp a man to a pulp for looking at his wife in a wrong way, who wouldn't take five minutes to crack his Bible to read to his wife and children. Bizarre. God is, through Paul, is speaking here to take care of an issue that was happening where the women were a part of the chaos. Also, I think it's a rebuke to the men. That's why you're going to see the language you're going to see. Now, folks, I've been pastoring for more than 40 years now. I don't want to say I've seen it all because as sure as I say that, I'll get to see something I've never seen before and go, Oy vey, I thought I'd seen it all. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of women who run things at home, who want to run things in the church. In fact, I have memory of a pastor's wife who would pop off in church, I mean, just say the most ridiculous I, I followed him, church I pastored years ago. Why a pastor who finds a good wife finds it incredibly precious. I have that. If my wife were to pop off in church, every one of us would fall dead in a faint. So it's all about the appearance of propriety in terms of God's order. So keep that in mind. He's not, not putting a gag order on women praying or singing. I, I, know, I know a man who pastored, he's not pastoring now, and you don't understand why, uh, who said that he taught this meant that women should not even sing in church. When they sang the Psalms, it should just be the voices of men. It wound a little too tight for my what it's about. It's about order, minimizing chaos, casting the uh, context, men leading women and their wives, wives supporting, bidding. So look at what he says here. In, in Timothy, going to the Timothy passage. The next verse, verse 13, says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is his argument. And then secondly, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became the transgressor. So when Paul argues this to Timothy, this same principle, God has an order coming out of creation that must not be violated. I want to say parenthetically, I... I I'm sympathetic to women who are serious students of the world, who are very devotional in their Christianity, and who ache because the husband has not, will not, has been convinced by the enemy of our souls that he cannot lead. I ache for that. Tell women, pray. I'll pray with you. God will light a fire under your husband. To, to lead, feed, protect, to nurture, to help shepherd the home. If I'm talking to somebody here who says, preacher, you're making me really uncomfortable, come see me. It's, it's, it's not a cardinal sin. It's not, the, it's not the unpardonable. There's a way out of this. There's a way through this. We offer men's fraternity. I've offered it several times since I've been here to get men in the track to be what God expects us to be. Men are to lead in love. Women are to submit in love. God's design is that. So, so he's addressing this matter in Corinth. Because in Corinth, these mystery cults 
Go just read the history. You know who the mystery cults were led by? Women. I'm not going to be indiscreet here, but, but, the, but part of the paganism, remember we told you when we started this study, you wanted to insult a woman in the first century, you would say to her, you're just a Corinthian woman. That meant something. And so these women, these are being saved out of the paganism of that culture, out of the, out of the immorality of the, of the religious culture there. And, and they come in and they're saved by grace and they're being transformed, but, they're, but they haven't just uh, had any kind of pixie dust sprinkled over them so that now they're just totally sanctified. Definitely. They're still carrying some of this stuff with them. And so Paul is addressing in his, in his last effort to deal with the chaos in Corinth and to bring back to it order, harmony, symmetry. He's addressing this. So he says that they should keep silent. Don't put themselves in a position where they're speaking out so as to uh, challenge pastoral authority in the church. Speaking out in such a way that, you know, and I, this is my caricature of this here, but preacher, can you tell me something? Because my husband's so stupid and lazy, he won't tell me. That's, hear this right. It's a challenge to men to man up. And it's a challenge to women to follow the flow of God's, uh, God's principles on order of the home Church is, what is the church? It is a collection of homes come together under the Lordship of Christ. He says, if there's anything they desire to learn, verse 35, let them ask their husbands at home. Again, that's not an injunction. It says you can't ask a question. He's talking about corporate worship here. We have, uh, we have co-ed classes couple of them on Sunday morning. Perfectly legitimate. When the leader in the class, follow me now, who is leading that class under the authority of, of the pastor church, because I can't be everywhere, and when a question is asked of a woman, in fact, when, when, when we invite women to pray in prayer meeting, that's not inviting them to step outside of Scripture. That is all happening under the pastoral authority of the God's, God-ordained structure of a church. And so that's not wrong at all. Tonight, you come tonight and Brother Norman engages us in this discussion of prayer and asks a question, it's perfectly legitimate for a woman to answer. Because this passage is not talking about those informal settings. It's talking about corporate worship, where you gather, carry on the worship of the true and living God where you gather to hear the Word of God preached, where you gather to praise God together. Remember the, the context of this. Don't, don't take this. We don't want to make it less, any less than it should. We're not going to have Beth Moore standing here to preach as long as I'm alive and breathing for several reasons, by the way. But one, it's just not going to happen. Scripture forbids it. Someone needs to tell her that. All right, so... Uh, that it's shameful for a woman to speak church. In other words, it's disgraceful. It, it is, the word mean, <laughs> means it is, it is contrary to the manifestation of God's grace in his people. So that's what he's dealing with here. Make, make much of what it says. Do not make anything of what it does not say. Walk with balance. You, you should have been around here long enough now. Recognize that in life, we're always holding the tension. We're always avoiding the ditches. One ditch is, hey, and this is the 21st century. The other ditch is muzzling women. Both of those are wrong. He is dealing with concern. We don't have that concern here, in case you're wondering. There are plenty of places where tongues runs amok. 
You just go listen. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it suggest you do it often? Time in your life, go listen. Take it in and see, and just observe what you're doing. You'll understand completely what Paul's going after here. Deal with that in a moment. If, and then he says in verse 36, or was it from you that the word of God came? This is very sarcastic here. So, this, I, so do you Corinthians think that you guys originated the word? You're, you're the authors of the word? Paul's dealing here with an attitude. He's been dealing with since the very beginning of the letter that, that they think they are a law unto themselves. I don't care what Paul said. This is our understanding. This is what we're going to do. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. So that's what he's, he's dealing with that. Was it from you that the word of God came? Did, did Scripture spring from Corinth? Or are you the only ones that has reached? Are you the only ones who understand the word? He is really pressing them now because he's anticipating uh, a response. One writer said this. He said, he's saying, in effect, if you didn't write Scripture, then obey it. If you're not the sole receivers of God's word, then subject yourselves to it as faithful children of God, as Christians everywhere else are obliged to do. Bottom line to this is what he's doing. No believer has a right to overrule, ignore, alter, or disobey the word of God. To do so is to put yourself above God's word. So this is checking the the attitude of people. Well, I know the Bible says that, but. And as soon as you get that adversative conjunction, but, then it doesn't matter what they said before. Paul's dealing with his apostolic authority, believing, understand that he's, he's writing Scripture. Paul didn't doubt that. We looked at that in 1 Corinthians 2 when we started this letter. Secondly, I want you to see the test of the genuineness of prophetic spirituality. Here I think he, he is letting us know that he really still has in mind prophecy and tongues. Watch this. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet, well he, this is the context of his, of his saying who may speak and who may not speak, or spiritual, and the word spiritual here in the context seems to be a sort of a shorthand reference to speaking in tongues. What they were saying in Corinth. That's what spirituality looks like. Who? He's really spiritual. Did you see how he spoke in tongues today? But he's using this as shorthand. If anyone thinks he is a prophet, prophecy, or spiritual, tongues, then he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. He says, let's test this. You agree with me? Anyone in your congregation who claims to have the prophetic gift and, and dismisses what I'm teaching you? is himself dismissed. Anyone who claims to have the gift of tongues and challenges what I'm teaching you should be dismissed and the conclusion that that gift is not legitimate. That's kind of, that's what he's saying. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Calling upon the rank and file congregation in Corinth, but especially the leaders, to challenge anyone who would who would again conduct chaos in their corporate worship, for the leaders to say, Paul said not to do that. Paul says that's wrong. The Lord told Paul that's wrong. And if they're challenged by that, if they if the if people bow up about that, then they have exposed themselves as whatever they're doing, they're not doing as a manifestation of the charismata, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy in their lives. Paul's dead serious about this. Then he says it's the Lord's commandment. What he's telling them, what he's instructing them, is the commandment of the Lord. It's not the 11th commandment. It's just teaching that he has received from the Spirit of God when he was in the Arabian desert after he was converted to come back and to, to preach the gospel, build gospel churches. So what he's saying to them is not one of these things. It would be good if you tried this. Or be kind of, no, this is what the Lord said. He did it in 11, if you remember. If anyone's contentious, when we get to the end of what we're reading in chapter 11. Anyone's contentious? He'll come around if he really believes. Finally, the sum of the matter. Well, here's the conclusion. This is where he's been heading, by the way, since chapter 12. 
possibly chapter 11. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy. There's a general, we talk about this, there's a general and a specific. The specific manifestation of prophecy, when he, when he laid out in the earlier verses in chapter 14, would be how that conducts itself in the context of worship. Two, maybe three. To them. But there's a general principle. Brothers and sisters, if you're saved by grace through faith in Christ, you should be looking for opportunities to prophesy, to tell forth the truth of God's glorious gospel in Jesus Christ. Across the fence to your neighbor, at coffee with a friend, uh, in the supermarket, with family when you're together, to tell forth the glorious riches. That's men and women should do that. That's what witnesses do. We witness. We bear witness. And a woman should not hesitate if she's in the marketplace, on the job, at school, to speak to a male colleague, a male friend, about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let the devil bind you and gag you. Earnestly. Desire prophecy. And do not forbid speaking in tongues. He's talking about legitimate tongues here. Now, Paul's aware that what he said in chapters 12 and 13 and, and early part of 14 can be taken wrong. That the, that the conclusion would be at this time in the life of the church at Corinth that they would simply just prohibit tongues. They note, Paul says, do not forbid. Now, we've already studied through this to know that, that tongues... Uh, was a was a temporary um, spiritual phenomena that that virtually I'm not going to say absolutely virtually disappeared when the scripture came into uh, written form. We gave this caveat though: where there is not written scripture today, it would not be unrealistic or necessarily wrong to see the manifestation of of tongues where where the gospel is proclaimed in a language understood by some, not heretofore known by the person proclaiming it. That's still the miracle, getting the gospel to every nation, every tribe, every people under heaven. Do not forbid. Earnestly desire prophecy. You get, he's, he's still on this superiority of prophecy to tongues. Do not forbid tongues. So it's a strong commendation for prophecy. It's, it's a Sort of, you know, don't, don't just totally abolish it. Tongues came to an end, and the canon of Scripture was complete. Manifestation that's been showing up since then is not what the Scripture teaches. Tongues. But all things could be done decently and in order, and that's, this is what triggered Paul, if I can use that best sense of the term. This is what was his concern was. Corinth, in their congregational gatherings and in other aspects of the life of the church, was about chaos, not about harmony. That's the word here when he says that they should be decent, the word gracefully, harmoniously, beautifully. In other words, their worship just like their, their personal lives, their family lives, should adorn the gospel of Christ. There's something very wrong, whether it, whether it takes on the form of a worship service where a lot of folks are, are at the same time speaking multisyllabic, uh, unintelligible gibberish, or whether, whether it's a Baptist church having a knockdown, drag out slugfest in a business meeting. Nothing about that that adorns the gospel renders the gospel the appearance of being weak and ineffective. The gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, is a transforming message. We're to demonstrate it with transforming lives so that the Corinthian women, if I can use that example, should have denied themselves, should have submitted to the glorious gospel for the good of the congregation and the glory of God. Anyone who was causing trouble and strife, and we know that there were those taken from another to court, should have submitted, should have denied themselves, and, and 
strive to manifest the beauty and the harmony of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And then order, the word order, decently in order. The word there, we've, we've seen it before, means in turn or one at a time, not chaos. Now, folks, I saw last week, we don't have, we don't have that problem here, all right? There's another ditch, stay out of, that's complacency. Chaos is a ditch that'll do you in complacency. I, my, my appeal is don't, don't be complacent. Don't you be, you provoke your children not to be courage and an active listening and participation uh, and engaging of worship of true and living God, worship that honors God. God is a God, not of confusion, but of order. He expects his worship to take on an aroma, propriety of decency of orderliness not not like rows of tombstones in a cemetery but of well fitted body parts in a functioning healthy body we come to worship that way. purpose we've prayed about it what did you pray this morning before you came what did you pray last night did you pray dear god Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your word to behold your beauty, your glory, to see the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up. Open my eyes that I may see where I need to change, where I need to slay remaining sin, where I need to stir up uh, the gifts that you've given in me in saving, where I need to provoke others to love and good work. Is that, is that what you were praying about? Coming here, you see, Paul wants the Corinthians to be engaged in a beautiful, wonderful, harmonious, well-functioning, healthy body, not the chaos, the cacophony that was life church at Corinth. He's taken quite a bit of space, this one letter. Speak to that. There's better things. There's better things to talk about. Chief among them, as he's going to say next week, first importance, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And the ultimate glory, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that he was raised three days later, according to Resurrecting King, resurrecting you, are you living a resurrected life? Could you be lost and live the same way you're living? Or is the explanation of the way that you're living tied exclusively to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? The tomb of Christ is empty. That's what we're going to be investigating next week or two or three. We look at these glorious 58 verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's bow together. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know, uh, we know from our own pilgrimage, we know from simply gazing up into the night sky, looking over the mountain ranges, looking into the Grand Canyon, looking at the beaches and the oceans, we know that you are a God of order, that we live in the cosmos. You're the cosmetic God. And we repent, but in our lives individually, we demonstrate chaos, confusion. We repent when our homes, when our families take up an aroma of chaos and confusion. And especially we repent when congregational life manifests itself in chaos and confusion. We know it is contrary to your character as the God of the cosmos. Help us, Lord. Take to heart what we've read today. Thank you for the precious women we have here who, who oftentimes can hardly get them to pray aloud or speak up because I know they don't want to violate scriptural teaching. Help them, release them, Lord, to see what this is teaching and what 
And I pray for our men, Lord, that, that we would be men. We would lead with compassion, the sense of deliberate to, to be men who, who will teach at home, who will, who will listen to our wives. And dear God, I see here part of the problem at Corinth was not just women causing chaos. It was men sitting back passively letting it happen. So we pray you will work in our lives to protect us from this chaos, but also to build us up and strengthen us as men who lead our wives, to lead our children, to lead our grandchildren, to lead in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the women come along beside us as, as helpers suitable to us. That beautiful harmony of the dance, male leadership of female fellowship, as we all seek to imitate Christ and Work that increasingly, dear Lord. Protect us. Evils of the day, the winds of the day, which, which are blowing completely contrary, which talk about toxic masculinity and, and, and bigotry and, and misogyny and, and, a, and a Bible that is, that is hateful. To, dear God, help us rise. Rise. And against these winds, currents, Sweep our children away, our grandchildren away, if we do not stand in the gap. Help us. Your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, the advance of his gospel. Good of our own souls. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.